All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Female Voice Zoomcast. I'm Shanice. And I'm, and I'm Lauren. I'm Neka. And I'm Takara. Today's discussion is going to be led by Neka, so I'm going to kick off to her. Go ahead, Neka. All right. So today we're talking about patriarchy, misogyny, and toxic masculinity. So I'm going to start off with giving some definitions of those terms in case you're not familiar. Patriarchy, a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. Misogyny is a dislike for, uh, a contempt for, or ingrained prejudice against women. Also related to misogyny is misogyny noir, which specifically is misogyny towards Black women. And then there is toxic masculinity, which is basically a cultural concept of manliness that glorifies um, stoicism, strength, virility, dominance, and is socially maladaptive or harmful to mental health. Basically like all the worst traits in men. <laughs> so, um, so let's just talk about what is actually at the root of patriarchy, misogyny, and toxic masculinity. What do you guys think it stems from? Those three things. Power. <laughs> I'm like, yes. I mean, I feel like that's it, right? I feel like it's very simple. Power, you know, um, no matter what race of men we are referring to, it's like, it's this, their egos, they need this power. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, our society allows this where they have all this power over women. I would also say patriarchy too, because that's kind of like at the, the kind of the core of everything that every system that we have in place is really to keep one group men um, in power. And so all of the other systems are kind of built around that. So um, you have to, or it's, it's useful to have a hatred for women or, you know, a desire to kind of oppress them because that will also kind of continue this system of like, we're at the top, they're at the bottom because of this whole system is designed that way. So um, that's kind of how I always think of it. Yeah, almost like a flow chart and patriarchy is up here exactly. and then we get this and right. then we get that and all of these right. fall out from the patriarchy. Right. And, and I would agree with Lauren. Um, and if you think about patriarchy, it all starts kind of a lot of religions um, are tied to patriarchy, uh, like um, men being the head and women um, being submissive to the men. So um, if you think about the way society starts are set up, um, religion is basically within all societies. And a lot of the a lot of the dominant religions, they kind of have that um, men should be head and women should be submissive to men. But, and, and then there's a little bit more, if you go off of the biblical scripture, there's a little bit more to that scripture. It is also as man is uh, submissive to Christ, which they kind of leave that part out. But but it's all kinds of, it kind of stems from um, religion. And then when society, societies are set up, they are, religion kind of dominates uh, society. So that's where I think it kind of started from. Yeah, I think you are right about that. Religion plays a big role, especially the Abrahamic religions, whether it's Christianity, um, Islam or Judaism, you can see the oppression of women and, um, you know, the leaders of those religious institutions are always men and the, the gods or the higher power that's worshipped is always, you know, male. And it, it just sets up... Um, a culture where men are um, kind of revered, sometimes even worshiped, and women are thought to be lesser than. Um, you know, I hear a lot of uh, Christian women saying how they are the neck and the man is the head. And I just feel like I hate that. I cringe because I'm like, I'm not anybody's damn neck. <laughs> I'm like a, a whole fully functioning person that has a brain and is capable of doing everything that a man can. I'm not here to be a helper, a little helper to a man so he can thrive on this earth. Um, but I do think that those are a lot of the messages that are, um, you know, drilled through religion, unfortunately. Right. And it's like, 
how Shanice was saying, um, you know, like men are supposed to be like submissive to Christ. But as you can see, it's almost as if men are resistant to that, right? If he's supposed to be the big man, you know, the one that every, you know, the man that everybody is supposed to be, you know, submissive to because he's, you know, the father and in charge and the Trinity and, you know, all these things they refer to him as. It's like men are even resistant to that because that's half the problem. It's like, you know, they're supposed to be, you know, all revert and the, the men are not doing what, they supposed to do i mean they're not you know following christ and following the bible and doing things you know so it's kind of like you know they supposed to be leading but they really aren't in the position to do that but that might be another question later so that's not right now that that's that's going into something else <laughs> with this subject look that's a nice uh little segue unless anybody had something else on it yeah well, I, go, go ahead lauren go ahead, go ahead lauren no, I was just going to say that um, society has changed over a period of time. So when we were, um, you know, kind of based on like this strength based hunter gatherer kind of system, whoever was the strongest was, you know, they had the ability to be dominant. But as our society has kind of moved away from the need for those kinds of systems, uh, we don't necessarily have to keep the same things going in the same way that we always did them. So I think that's the other part of it is that like we are kind of doing all of this like hunter gatherer mindset where we are no longer hunting nor gathering. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of changes out there. Okay. And we're, we're slow to uh, adapt and adjust apparently. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about what ways patriarchy, misogyny and toxic masculinity limit women's freedom and progress coming from like any aspect or so many aspects. Like I think about just the pay gap, you know, how um, we do the same work, but get paid less uh, for being women, which is a big one. And I also feel like women get kind of the short end of the stick in uh, relationships, marriage and parenthood where they are doing the lion's share of the work and men can kind of just coast along, even though in today's society, you know, women are often working just alongside with men, but, you know, we have to take on all the additional responsibilities plus work while they kick their feet up. What do you guys think? I think it's uh, like back to what Lauren was just saying about, you know, is no, like things are no longer what they were before. However, things seem to not have changed much for men. It's, it's us who've changed and adapted, right? So, um, you know, even just not just hunter gatherer, right? Now we can even talk about the 1950s where we were living on one income and men paid all the bills and women stayed home and handled the children and the family, um, the home. But we're not doing that. Now we're doing both. We are working because we need two incomes most families almost every family now needs two incomes to survive if you have a family you know what i mean that now i mean it's even more so true with what's going on with inflation so now you have the you know um women have added to their traditional roles but men their role has not changed they still just working and saying what everything women's supposed to do and supposed to be bringing to the table and meanwhile, we basically are the table. We doing everything. We working. We taking care of the kids. We washing clothes. I mean, we doing everything. It's ridiculous, child. But it also depends I'm, on. Like, I'm, not, I'm not happy about this. I'm I'm single. I do not have children. I'm not married. And this is some BS for women who are in this situation. I'm sorry. Like it's it. Like Nick has said, it's the short end of the stick. We not hunter gatherers no more. It is not 1950. Like men gotta. They need to contribute well, more. Some, some men do. I, I want to be, you know, fair to some men too. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that too, um, because it really depends on who you marry too. But because do you think it's the majority of men or the minority of men that are um, putting in as much work as women in parenting and mar marriage? I would say it's hard to say. It's hard to speak to everybody's relationship. Um, minority. Yeah, I would I definitely think it's a the very small minority too. And especially when we look globally, definitely, definitely the minority. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, when we are kind of talking about these things, I think it it's, can be a disservice if we paint a broad brushstroke about what all people do. 
Um, I would agree with you. I do think that, you know, women have a large portion, but it is not unheard of in all systems across everything. That's the only thing I would say. And I think we just have to just be careful that, um, you know, we're accounting for those men that are, you know, there are stay at home fathers and mm-hmm. people that um, take on those roles also. Right. So, and you yeah, start, nothing is in absolutes for right. sure. But I mean, we're talking about misogyny, patriarchy and toxic masculinity. So I'm not going to focus on the guys who, you know, have it right. Just kind of focusing on where it gets ugly. But that's that's the the problem is that that's the majority. I mean, it's just the truth that that's the majority mm-hmm. because I know some of those men. My father was somebody who actually worked and took care of us. My father was very present, you know, when we were growing up, and you know, like he would cook and do those things and do like my parents did both. So I grew up in a family where my parents actually did both, even though my father was the primary breadwinner and my mother didn't even work till we were like older. I said, so I mean, I can think and I have some friends. I know somebody who. Um, was a stay at home father for like two years he quit his job and like to you know like literally like stay home with his son so no I agree with you that it's not absolute but unfortunately that is the exception to the rule and that's just a plain old fact most men are not doing that right do they you paying the that? bills and they thinking like well I'm supposed to pay the bills and you supposed to do everything like what is you doing as a woman do you think it's generational too do you think older generations are more apt to fit to tradition than younger the younger generations um, cause I, I'm a classroom teacher. Cause I, I kind of see parenting from both perspectives. I do have a lot of dads that do a lot in my, and just, just over my years as teaching, um, I've, I've seen men step up to the role. So do you think it's a, could be a generational thing too? Um, cause I, mean, I think patriarchy has been around for ages. I mean, I just, I mean, but I think that I'm, uh, like, regardless of the generation, because my father is, you know, you know, was from the era of Vietnam, right? Like my father is uh, older, my father is older than probably some of my other, my friend's parents. And then my friend who I'm speaking about, who was um, who was a stay-at-home father is our age. So mm-hmm. these are two completely, you know, different generations. I just think this is something that we have been conditioned to for years. And um, it's just, it's just, it's just the minority, it's the exception to the rule is you have, you know, there are some men who do, you know, do their responsibility. Like you say, I mean, not do their responsibilities, but who have adapted to, you know, I'll help take care, you know, of some of the household stuff. I'll cook, I'll do these things, you know, that traditionally men don't do. We we have just been conditioned to that. And, you know, I'm not saying that everything is all their fault, but I think that some people need to like recognize that more and we shouldn't just always kind of protect them I think we've been socialized to that too like women we supposed to just you know protect them at all costs and it's like mm, sometimes they need to you know wake up and help out more because I definitely have more friends who have that issue you know mm-hmm. where they are you know uh, women who have you know kids and they feel like their partner doesn't help as much as he as they should and often the woman makes more money too so mm-hmm. Mm. And I don't even think that would be that much of an issue if the woman felt like the man was, you know, um, participating more with the household duties. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you, Takara. Um, Another angle I wanted to discuss is like, um, I recently saw something on social media. It was asking women what they would do if there were like no men on the earth, what freedoms they would feel they have. And it was like really sad just reading the responses and the way, looking at the ways we are really restricted and the things that we do, the places that we go, like people were talking about how they would feel free to like walk places at night, to jog and work out outdoors at night. And um, you know, different things that they could wear and not being scared of, you know, riding on the train at night and, all of these things, um, you think about like rape culture and um, sexual harassment at, in the workplace. There's just a lot of um, ways that, you know, these three things affect women um, terribly, really. It's very restrictive and very um, oppressive, I think. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, I will be clear. I definitely don't want to like completely get rid of me. But <laughs> no, I don't. It's either. interesting. Like you, the question is interesting, though, to think about it because 
we weren't even talking about crime, but the majority of crime, yeah. 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 I mean, wars, we probably wouldn't have. Not to say that we would never go to war, but I think that we would find other ways to deal with problems. You know, things don't, women aren't so, um, you know, it's not always corporal, right? Corporal punishment. Like we don't, it's not always that idea to solve problems. Um, and I mean, that has not been my experience. You know, maybe what a lot of these other women experience is more so what I hear from people, what you see on the news, all of these things. But I could see why women might, like you say, potentially rejoice and feel like, you know, I could have a different kind of life freedom and a lot of my fears would be taken away if, um, you know, it was only women in society. Um, it's bitter, a bittersweet thought, actually. Yeah. All right. So um, another thing that I want to talk about, what, what, how can we make change? Like, how can we reduce misogyny um, and toxic masculinity that's pervasive in our culture? Um, so we can live better lives. Like for me, I feel like for grown men, I mean, change grown people period change is difficult. Um, and it's hard, like having these conversations a lot of times with men who have their own viewpoint, um, which is, can be very different from ours. And when I think about ways to change some of those things, I really mostly think about focusing on children because (laughs) a lot of these men, it's really difficult to get some of these points driven home. And it's like, you know, you'll go around and around talking about these things. And sometimes they're just not really seeing it kind of in denial um, about the ways, you know, that they have privilege in society. I think it's kind of universal. Most people do not want to accept that they have privilege in society and they will deny it and make excuses and gaslight. But it is being male in society is a privilege and it comes with benefits that we just don't have access to. Um, And so I just think about like raising boys, you know, all the things they say, you know, kind of excusing bad behavior, boys will be boys and telling boys not to cry and to suppress their feelings and to man up and all those kind of things can be pretty harmful. And it gets men to this point where they're really only comfortable expressing anger Um, which then turns into, you know, violent outbursts and behaviors sometimes when they're going down the wrong path, Um, but allowing them to have a whole free range of expression um, and not just funneling everything through anger and not shutting little kids down, little boys down um, when they're expressing their emotions or making fun of them, calling them soft, Mm -hmm. um, and also kind of treating them equally, like they should also be be having to cook and clean as they're growing up, just like their sisters, you know, cooking and laundry and cleaning. Those are life skills. They're not for the female gender only. Um, but I think a lot of this comes up from when they're babies and beyond. And I think we really have to start there with the youth and the children because I try to have some of these conversations with the men. It's tough. I mean, some of them get it, but I would say the majority of them yeah yeah I would definitely echo that I think that um you know it's important that we have conversations with our children and you know in the the spaces that we work about how to feel free to have conversations because if you also talk to a lot of men they will say that they they do it's not that they don't have emotions they're just not as free to express them or it's not necessarily encouraged so when we look at things like um you know suicide that occurs in black males, um, the rates are very high in terms of their um, actual carrying out the, the, um, the act because the way that they manifest or show symptoms is not the same as women. And so often, particularly from, um, you know, kind of like a, a counseling perspective, there's always these things that we, we look at or that men are supposed to behave in a certain way. And, um, you know, we we have to really blur those lines a little bit more so that everybody has positive um, and effective coping skills and mechanisms. Um, the other thing I will kind of say is that, you know, if we are in relationships also, I think it's completely fine to have these conversations mm-hmm. and express the ways that we are different, the ways that we are same as well. 
Um, one of the things about patriarchy is that it doesn't necessarily um, support women um, communicating or being heard when they do have opinions about things or feeling like they can express um, differences of opinion if those things are not necessarily supported. So I just think a lot of it is really just our conversation, talking to each other and, um, you know, opening, opening dialogue between the genders as well. So um, there's a lot of room for growth for all of us. Yeah. And I agree with you both. It's like kind of you have to restructure norms. Mm -hmm. um, so as they are getting, as they are coming up, as they're being educated about how to be a man in society, you kind of have to restructure those norms that were already created. Um, so I definitely agree with that. Um, also encourage encourage therapy as they grow up and not seeing it as a weakness, so that they can deal with the the feeling of. Because um, I was I was at just to just to throw it off for a second. I was at a rally yesterday, and a lot of times people create uh, commit violence due to being in survival mode. So feeling like you're always in the fight and flight. And if you're asking a young man to suppress those feelings from a very, very young age, you're always going to be in that fight or flight mode. So um, it's important that we we help we as women and as um, and like you said, like when we're in our relationships that we under we, we tell our men it's OK to feel this way, you know, because all that suppressed emotion that can create havoc in our society. So getting getting men out of that survival mode. Um, mm -hmm. Also, representation is important, especially um, when we talk about our freedoms, like we just lost um, the right for abortion. And um, so it's important that we are represented everywhere, you know, and, you know, so that way we can be that voice of advocacy for women. So and um, so, yeah, those are my things. I think that would change. So we need representation everywhere. And like you guys said, uh, restructure the norms and um, tell them it's okay. It's okay to feel. It's okay to show your emotion. You don't always have to be out of the, the survival mode. So, um, Right. I mean, like you said, I think that's definitely, um, like you say, a negative aspect of that toxic masculinity because it really ends up worse for them. You know, I mean, our what we deal with is, you know, what we deal with in our everyday lives, women seem to have found a way to adapt and to make it through. And I mean, as you see, like, it seems like even though patriarchy affects women negatively and it keeps us um, oppressed in a way, for some reason, if we think about it, the men have the worst consequences because they are the ones that fill up the prisons. They are the ones who, like you say, are having the higher rates of suicide. Um, you know, when it's fight or flight, they that tends to be more fight, right? Because you are seen as weak if you walk away or if you go. But there's something to be said about choosing your battles wisely. You know, you every action does not require a reaction and I'm like I mean really if they took the time to just kind of look at all of this in totality and over the years mm -hmm. you know they are the ones sent to war and put on the front lines you know to be murdered for something that some other man decided he wanted to conquer or you know be a part of and we're going to fix this and this is how we're going to do it I mean those things you know, are their way of serving the country. and do, But really, it's, these things are det have been detrimental to their own kind. But they keep doing it. I mean, it's like... I, the patriarchy I, is harmful to men, too. That's yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it really That's is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also important to consider, um, you know, when we talk about... Um, like therapy as well. There's a lot of research that, um, you know, many men are not going to participate in therapy just because they that's not supported in our culture. So there might be other things that they can do, you know, um, you know, working with animals or exercise, there might be more effective methods for them or in addition to just the, the talk therapy mindset that they, they might not be likely to do that. So if our response is only therapy um, and people are, we know are not likely to do that, then there, there need to be more opportunities for discussions in different spaces. Um, so 
You're, you're right. I mean, we just similar to racism, you know, racism is not something that only black people should talk about. These are conversations that men need to have with other men about their own behavior. Right. We as women should talk about it. Um, but these conversations belong to them also. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the big thing as well, where it's like they are the, the originators of the oppression. And so they need to be working um, diligently to make sure that things are a little bit more um, equitable. Yeah, but they too busy talking about us, right? They got all these <laughs> podcasts and they talking about us and everything that we doing wrong. But like you say, the, the trouble is, is really the patriarchy probably is more detrimental to them than it is to us because we have somehow made all of this work for us over these years. I mean, you know, that, you know, entrepreneurial gap and, you know, pay, um, well, if you're in a traditional work pace, uh, workplace, pay is still unequal. Women are still being paid less. However, um, what men, I mean, like now where we talk about women in business, we have outpaced men in degrees and education and business and all of these things, right? So I'm like, the patriarchy is not helping them, but they seem to somehow still like, you know, is somehow our fault. You know I mean? I think about T.D. Jakes and his recent comments. It's kind of like, see, and he's not even stopping to think for a minute, like, these things are not bad for the black people. Women, we want to be with other black women, want to be with other black men, you know, but it's, it can be difficult for us when, you know, I mean, I even think about my patients that I see, like what you're talking about, Lauren, I, they come in when they're 50 and 60 years old after they've had three marriages, they don't talk to their children, oh, yeah. you know, they've been divorced, like all of these things, they've lost jobs, they've been arrested, all of these things have happened in their lives. You know, some of them, it can turn into, you know, where they end up abusing drugs to help cope with all these problems when this is something they could have dealt with maybe when they were 22 something they could have dealt with when they were 30 I mean that would be better than wait until you know you have suffered all of these consequences where the trouble is the societal norms the patriarchy all of this was born out of like this patriarchy and men are kind of shuffled down this road and we all just accept it and let it go and all of that could really be you know different if like you say, if we were all having these conversations, not just us, but like you say, men talking to other men about mm -hmm. things don't have to be this way. Like there is another option. There are lots of other options. That's the other thing. There's lots of other options. When you talk about um, blurring the lines and uh, like you say, reframing, challenging things, there's lots of gray area, but we don't discuss that. Everything is so like black and white and that's just not reality. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, I um the other thing that I was thinking about how to make improvements is with through sex education. Um, I think, you know, there's sex education curriculum, but I really think that consent needs to be in there. It seems to be misunderstood um, between boys and girls, men and women at times. And I'm not sure that everybody has a good understanding for where people are coming from. I'm thinking about uh, a discussion that I had with a group of people just talking about how women often will have sex when they don't actually want to. Mm -hmm. And the guys, their minds were blown. Like, what are you even saying? Like, and I was saying it's not really necessarily uh, rape, but sometimes women are kind of acquiescing. Yeah. And they're not really, they don't want to. And, you know, they just couldn't believe it. And I was like, you know, I think that consent has to be enthusiastic. It shouldn't be something where you're pressuring, 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 pressuring this woman or this girl um, to do something that you want to do, right? It should be both people are happily, eagerly ready to engage, not you coercing somebody into doing something. And the, I think the men that I was speaking with had a really hard time kind of grasping that that's what happens. Um, but all of the women seem to understand how that can happen. So I think that consent, <laughs> we have to go behind just, this is where, you know, beyond where babies come from and blah, 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 and showing the nasty pictures of the STIs um, <laughs> into more deep discussions um, about, consent about, you know, people who are maybe out of it due to the drugs, alcohol, whatever, um, all the kind of gray areas that come up, but are never formally taught or discussed. 
Right. It's not talked about till it happens. And it's funny you say that because me and my mom have been watching The Shy and there is a scene in there where like these are these middle school kids and one has an older brother who's taking care of the younger brother who's in middle school. Mm -hmm. And the older brother is basically telling these kids, like giving them advice on women. And it is like horrible advice. Right. It's basically all of this misogynistic. I mean, it's basically not I mean he's not saying rape them but he's basically telling them like well if she say no you know go sleep with her friend and you know I mean this is also with like all these curse words and I mean it's like it's but if you think about these are this is some of these kids reality is like this is the advice that they're getting in middle school that some older person is telling them like yeah that's how you deal with that oh if she don't want to do this she don't want to give it to you okay that's cool you just get her friend make her jelly oh you know you got that's how you get her attention like slap her around it's like that is terrible i like advice but but these things are happening in like in reality you know and i'm like i think it's a you know if you haven't watched the shot you you should watch it like it's a really good portrayal of lots of different people in a in a particular neighborhood all of different like economic socioeconomic statuses and all of the different things that they are all dealing with and how all of this intersects because intersectionality is like a big thing that we should be thinking about like you say not just in race but in life in general for all people and I mean it's like so funny like all of these like you said like these different things are coming to my mind as we're having this conversation today but it's yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent. Like there should be that talk needs to go deeper about these situations that you know, if you know that your child will if your child doesn't, um, your son is not or your daughter is not in that situation, they will probably have a friend who's gonna be in that situation. Like you say, you know, in college, these things it's happening. That's but- all I think your your parents should be the first person you talk to about sex too um because we we try to keep an open door with our kids like yeah this is you we don't want you to get information from somebody whose brain is not fully developed yet so um but then you get all those misconceptions so we rather them come to us so I think that's a that's a lot like like NECA was piggyback off of what NECA said earlier it starts it starts when they're young and so trying to teach them that even in those uh, high school, middle school courses, they need to make sure they're ready to fully understand what, what it is and what it means to have sex and what consent means too. Like, um, and even and even telling girls like, no, you, when you say no, it means no, no matter what your tone, <laughs> you know, and then reinforcing that to the boys. Cause some men are like, well, you said no, but you weren't very serious. So therefore, you know, it's not really no. So trying to teach them like no means no period, you know, even if it's playful, no, it still means no. Right. But it's some of these grownups is knuckleheads too, though, because they're, the kids are going to the parents and the parents are telling them. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of doing this too. I mean, we do have, um, you know, federal law, Title IX prohibits um, sex-based discrimination. And so there are, um, you know, laws that prohibit and can uh, increase knowledge that um, institutions and colleges are supposed to, um, you know, kind of teach this information. But there's so much misconception and there's so much of like, yeah, I get we're supposed to do that, but we don't do that. And that's accepted um, in other ways. So it's kind of like, you know, you you have to change the culture too. It's like, you can't just make a law that you can't discriminate. And then every single other thing in the, in the system goes against it. So you're right. Uh, yeah, that's, they're, they're knuckleheads out here too. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, it, you know, and I also, you know, want to think about too, like sometimes even, you know, speaking, you know, again, about women, um, you know, also when I think about like a lot of my friends, like I say, like my experience has not been my, my experience has been a positive one with me and, you know, whether it was my father, my brother, my grandfather, my uncles, like I have had all of my, you know, most of my experiences, especially within my family, it had all have been good ones. Right. So then you think about women who don't have any male influence, their first influence is when they are dating their mm-hmm. first influence is when they're in college, you know, so that's when they had, or, you know, or even as a child, and this may be a predator in a neighborhood, you know, these are things that happen that, you know, I don't think that we as society really recognize how often that occurs that women, have no male figure and then when they meet a male figure it may not be a good experience and then if if 
the absence of a man is already a bad experience, you know, not having, because really there is something that comes from having a man and a woman in the household, you know, and we don't have that. Or even if you don't have, if it's not your father, what if it's your uncle or a grandfather or, you know, a brother or some, you know, some positive male um, role model, you know, who can, you know, kind of have women be in a better space, you know, as far as when they do have these negative interactions with men, like in the, in, you know, in society. And I mean, I'm just saying that because now I'm thinking about, again, some of my friends who have not had good experiences with dating, some of them um, will kind of think that that's normal. And it's me, another woman who is telling them like, that's not normal. Like it, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, you know, and it's kind of like, well, they didn't really have any, you know, examples you know or role models when they were growing up so you know their view is kind of like well this is how it is this is how it's been and it's like well, I don't have to be that way you know so I mean I, I you know there is a it's a multifaceted issue in America for sure I mean it's so I mean gosh there's a lot of um you know like problems here and a lot of different avenues and ways I'm sure to you know fix it and what Lauren was saying just made me think about um, salary transparency um, and how that can be really helpful because we know Black women in particular are at the lowest position in the totem pole of pay a lot of times. And so, you know, it would be nice if in our jobs we knew what our colleagues were getting paid it wasn't such a secretive thing like why is it that it has to be a secret don't discuss your salary it's because <laughs> there's inequity everybody's getting paid something different with white men getting paid the most and then black men and then white women and then black women so it's kind of like it could be helpful that was a, a nice solution if everybody can see what people are getting paid. And then if you're being underpaid, you can ask to be compensated as you know your colleagues are. Um, and I think that's a, a big, quick, easy solution, but is it gonna happen? <laughs> and as a stay worker, my salary is published and it's still, they still have those inequities. So they will find a way <laughs> to make sure that we are um, you know, still kind of not getting the benefits that we need to. So I would definitely agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's just, it's a mess. The whole thing is a mess. Mm -hmm. Right, the whole system. And I agree with you. Like you say, like, because if you think about, like you say, state employees, federal employees, you know, everything is supposed to be, oh, it's fair and equal pay because we own these pay scales. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. that's right. They I'm will doing. find a way to like still underpay you. Yep. And that's what I was trying to figure out too. Cause I was like, I was talking to my husband. I was just like, well, if we're on a pay scale and we start at, at the same salary, how is it that, you still make more, you know, like, and then I get, I was like, well, maybe it's promotions. Like, do you really hire me on a scale of three and you hire him on a scale of four, even though we got the same degree? Like, it's like, I don't understand how they even discriminate if it's supposed to be like, if you're on a scale, then you're on a scale. Like, cause they got um, all these algorithms and they have these charts and all the, I mean, it's the most convoluted mess I ever seen in my life, but what they, like you say, but that is all in place to hide the inequity and in, protect the patriarchy that has allowed all this to happen over the years you're absolutely right mm. well <laughs> i mean it's the most kind of all these like i mean it's ridiculous like you say all this whole algorithm and all of this arbitrary mess that states and government you know all these places that use pay scales to pay people and it's really like you say they really make it where it's like you know you know they just keep moving the goalposts to change you know to keep things to keep that inequity going yeah. and they hide it you know it's like oh you can't really understand so you can't figure it out anyway <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's why we need to be yeah. in those built we need to be representation yeah representation right. needs to be everywhere we need to be deciding the pay squares we need to be right. Right. On the but you see they how they do there. The government they is like there. women is a problem it's a problem you know they are problem <laughs> they abrasive you know that's how they you know that's how they refer to us you know in government it's like we are to be silenced, really, if you think about it in government, because these things come up in government, you know, women talk about these kinds of issues, you know, and I mean, we do have men that support us, but they don't support us with the same enthusiasm as they, 
you know, will go to war with. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think there are men who do see, you know, our side of things and are really allies, but they, they're not quite as loud as their counterparts who uh, don't agree, and who are taking it to social media, dragging the, the ladies through the, through the dirt. But uh, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the representation is really important. Like I think about how, you know, the, we cannot get a female president for the life of us here in the United States, um, the heads of these Fortune 500 companies. And it's like the CEOs of all these places, they're all like the same white male, right? We, you can barely get a woman in there. If you do, it's it's a rare instance. And we really do need more representation in all areas and all facets um, because we have unique viewpoints and vantage points. Um, that other people, you know, like they always say diversity is best for teams, you know, team strength when you have diversity, but it's shown in research, we know it, but it doesn't seem to really be actualized when you look at what's going on, unfortunately. So right, it's not present from the top down. So it's the glass ceiling, like really, so we're not, we have to break that. We gotta get that, we gotta get something. <laughs> yeah. Break it. And we start with discussions like this. This is a good talk, ladies. Oh, I do want to add something, though. When yes. um, Shanice was talking about abortion, I mean, mm-hmm. that is a whole thing, how they slipped that in there. I mean, they really, that came out the blue out of nowhere. Like, why are you going to reverse something that was put in place hundreds of years ago? I mean, not hundreds, but um, when was that? Like, was it the 1960s or when was Roe v. Wade? I don't even remember the day. I believe it was the same. Yeah, something right there. Around, around but, that era. <laughs> right, right. In 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 uh, you know, so not even what 40 something, not even 50 years ago, right? That this was, you know, you know, that this like it's just interesting to me that that somehow that just kind of, you know, it's almost like it was a sneak attack, you know. And the other problem with that is is that abortion for some reason seems to um this fight against abortion it lie it basically places the responsibility of like bearing children having children is like all on women it's not all of our responsibility we don't have children on our own you know Hello. it's not just us i mean abortion birth control you know i mean everything is like supposed to be the woman's responsibility and then it's like okay but then you get pregnant you know like you don't now now it's like you don't even have a choice and i mean it's like people don't realize i mean it's like they don't even care i don't understand i mean it's like the twilight zone it's just sad that that we have been like you say like now we're in this position where like you say even if you're a victim of rape or something especially and then you got different governors different states are like no we're going to protect that and then you got these other states who are kind of like nope you know don't you could be prosecuted like now it's like they're gonna you know go and make laws where if you are found out having these things i mean it's like we're going back to slave times or something like we're gonna be we're gonna prosecute you and put you in jail for you know health care like for having something that could potentially be you know maybe something even um suggested by a doctor depending on the situation right there are situations where you know, aborting a child may be the best option for a woman, um, health-wise, right? Not just a personal opinion, but the, the personal opinion should not be taken away either. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just, that's a big problem. And it's, I feel like it's starting to get a little quiet too, right? That's another issue in America is how we kind of, you know, we'll get, you know, we'll be protesting things and then all of a sudden things will quiet down. And, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's like, I feel like that fight has gotten a little bit quieter, but, um, you know, it just basically is going to send women into unsafe practices for abortions going forward, which could be a more detrimental long-term, you know, issue that could affect society, you know, and, you know, have a trickle down, you know, a ripple effect that we, uh, people aren't seeing, but again, men aren't the ones who get pregnant or have menses or breastfeed or do any of the things that come along with, you know, being a primary caregiver and like actually, you know, raising a child, which can kill a woman in childbirth. I mean, it's just like, it's unfortunate. You don't even have a uterus, but you get to make these decisions. Right. And then too, like, because I, I, I was talking a little bit about this um, before, just um, with Aji, and we were talking about like how, because you we were like, well, 
you were talking about the rap videos and then how they, you know, that played into some of the misogyny. But then I was like, well, then you got women that are owning their own bodies now. Now female rappers are rapping about, you know, sex and a lot of a lot of the um, singers and stuff. But then you take away the abortion law, like you're asking us to be sexualized and we're sexualizing ourselves. And then so now you got this whole big, you know, kind of kebab, like I'm in charge of my own body, but I, I have this sexual right to be in charge of my whole, bo whole body, but then again, I'm not in charge of my own body. You right. see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, right. it's like kind of like a, a catch 22. You, there, there are women that are more, you know, open to talking about sex and, and being sexual, but at the same time, it's like, you don't have any control of your body, but you do have control of your body. It's, it's, it's really like, Men want the last say on that. That's, yeah, the, like, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and it right. was interesting. I was talking to this guy about, um, you know, he was kind of complaining and saying like, well, we don't get to choose whether a woman has an abortion or not. You know, that's something that you get to decide that we don't. And so when I said to him, like, well, you also don't have to have sex with women unprotected either. Right. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> you know, that was kind of like, what? Well, you know, I he was just saying, like, you know, I never thought about that or I never was. I was a kid. I was just doing what kids do. And so I think that's that's really the crux of it. It's like, why are we teaching boys that it's that they don't have to discriminate between their partners? Why are we not talking to them about that at all the way we do with women? Because that's they need to be doing that, too. It's like if you don't want her to be the mother of your children, don't have sex with her. Right. And that this needs to be part of that conversation that you yeah. all are talking about, that sex education, that should be part of it is there's an option for men to have a vasectomy. I mean, I've had conversations with men about vasectomies. It's like, I would never do, I don't want to do that. They don't even know what the procedure entails. However, it's like women are supposed to go and get a tubal ligation, all this, which is a much more invasive. We have higher risk. Like it's a much more invasive procedure for a woman to go and get a tubal ligation than it is for a man to get a vasectomy. And, but it's, it's always, you know, the onus is on us to, mm -hmm. you know, be the ones to take birth control pills. I mean, there was, you know, that whole talk about, which they've been talking about bringing that to the market, right? Like getting birth control pills for men. And I mean, I was into the D.L. Hughley show one time. Oh my Lord, those <laughs> men were on there. Like every man called it. I'm not taking that pill. She can take that. That's for the women. Oh, I'm not doing that. Uh-uh, she can take that. But we are teaching support. <laughs> a woman pregnant you are responsible too it's not just her mm -hmm. that needs to be part of the you know like you say the sex education it needs to go mm -hmm. deeper like you say we need to talk about like it's your responsibility as well it's not just okay you know you just leave her and just kind of give her money when you feel like it or never do anything for your child it's not good for you to just be absent that's part of you know and like you say and it also leading by example right because it's not enough just to tell children what to do oftentimes you need to be showing them and like you say that's why it's you know it is you know, easier to change starting with the younger generation than, you know, because some of these, like you say, older people is like, you know, kind of ingrained in them. It's hard. It's harder to change when those habits have been there longer. You've been socialized to believe all of this, you know, longer, but really it's a major gap. Like, um, like Laura was saying, like women, we are, you know, basically, you know, and it also comes naturally to women too, I think, you know, to just kind of be caregivers and take care of things. But I think, unfortunately, that men can take advantage of that and they can disappear and then women have all these kids and the men aren't around and it's like okay you know and then again it's just that vicious cycle of us continuing to have these problems in our communities mm -hmm. yeah any um any other closing remarks ladies no don't forget shout outs. Good don't forget shout outs you got any shout outs here we go <laughs> Um, I will shout out to myself. Um, follow me at, at Waste Watcher Beads on Instagram. If you need some fabulous waste beads, I got you. I'll shout out my uh, mental health page, the Black Psych and P B L K, um, on Instagram as well. And of course, we got to shout out the Black Advancement. Go ahead and visit them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, click and like and subscribe to their um, channel, click and like their videos. So shout out to the Black Advancement as well. All right, we got, we're done? All right. That's it, bye. All right, thank bye. you. Bye-bye.